Welcome to Capital Considerations, the podcast that takes complex ideas from the investment world and makes them accessible to everyone. I'm your host, Tony Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Wilmington Trust. I am incredibly excited to welcome two guests today. The first, Jonathan Gollum, is a former colleague of mine from two firms, Bear Stearns and UBS. Currently, Jonathan is Managing Director and Chief U.S. Equity Strategist at Credit Suisse, where he's responsible for the firm's equity outlook, including market and earnings forecasts, as well as sector and thematic recommendations. Also joining today is my current colleague, Head of Investment Strategy at Wilmington Trust, Megan Chu. Megan, as many of you know, manages our portfolio positioning and is a frequent contributor to CNBC and other media outlets. So we have a great group here today to talk about what's going on in the stock market. And in fact, the title of our podcast is COVID Stock Market, Suspending Belief. We think about all the traditional measures that tell us where the stock market should be heading, and we think about what's going on in the economy. It feels like stocks shouldn't be where they are today. So what we're going to explore is the disconnect between the stock market and what we see happening in the economy. So Jonathan, I think the place to start probably is just to establish a baseline. Why is it that for those of us that have been doing this for decades, if we're long equities right now, we should be waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat? You know, Tony, I think that what we need to do is to separate out what's going on in the markets from the fundamentals and to almost ignore the stock market price action and say, if we're obviously in a recession right now, how deep or, or rough is this recession compared to normal? So if you look at job losses and the um, millions of, of jobs that we've lost in only the last you know four or five weeks, and then compare that to what we've seen in, in, other, uh, in other contexts, uh, we haven't seen anything since the Great Depression, which has this kind of, of job losses. Um, if you look at the size of the Fed's balance sheet and the type of instruments they're buying, um, corporate bonds, municipal bonds, things of that nature, and, and then you look at the government deficit that are being put um, against this problem compared to what we would have done even in the financial crisis, and the potential or likely loss uh, GDP, the, the forecasts right now are for the second quarter GDP to be um, somewhere between three and five times worse worse than it was at the worst point in the financial crisis. And then you were to say, okay, great. Well, we have some, we have, now we've calibrated this environment versus um, other situations, and it's pretty bad. Um, how much did the stock market sell off during the, um, in, during the 08, 09 period? How much did it sell off during um, 2001, 2002? And then once we know that and how much, how much worse or better it should be this time around, we can then see whether the stock market is fairly discounting that. And if you do that kind of math, you, you say, oh my gosh, the market should be down by more than 30 or, or 50%, um, potentially much more than that. And so, so then the, the question you have to ask is, why is there a disconnect? And I think the, the real simple answer is that the, the Fed, if you will, has their thumb on, on the scale, that they are the incremental buyer. And it's not that they're buying equities, but their incredible engagement in the capital markets um, is is effectively um, forcing equity valuations higher, and so there is something else going on in the equity markets that that doesn't reflect the fundamentals. Well, yeah, and as you pointed out, Jonathan, if you look at the value of equities from a price to earnings standpoint, the multiple that equities stand at today is actually higher than before the coronavirus hit. Um, because earnings have come down. Prices have come down only about 13% at this stage. Earnings have come down a lot more given what's going on with the economy. So we're, we're, we're in this um, very odd scenario where fundamentals should tell us that stocks should be much lower, but they're, but they're not. So let's dig into this idea of the Fed providing a backstop. And it's not even just the Fed, right? It's also Congress and the legislature and the very significant many trillions of dollars fiscal backstop that we also have. What's the framework for thinking about how we should adjust our expectations for what fair value in the stock market is, given this incredibly strong vector that's sort of trying to keep the economy afloat, trying to keep our heads above water, water which is the combination of, of the Fed and this, this massive fiscal intervention on the part of, 
uh, the U.S. Congress? Well, I, first of all, it's, it's probably the single most difficult question to, to answer. But let's let, let's start with the first part of this thing, which is where are we? Um, we had a 19 multiple on a forward basis, a 19 PE on uh, February uh, 19th when the stock market hit its all-time high before rolling over. And right now, we, the market's trading with probably a 21 multiple. Now, if you look at other recessionary periods, we've never had a situation where you leave a recession um, you know, way more expensive than, than you entered. That There's no historical precedence for, for that. The second thing is, is, is it's... The, the Fed and the U.S. government can pump as much money as they want into this, especially of the ability to print, um, over the near term. Um, but over the long run, this is, the situation is going to renormalize, and, and you're going to pay something which looks like a fair value on this. first question I ask myself is, how long will it take for the earnings to recover? And historically, it takes about two and a half years for earnings to fully recover. At this time, it takes three years, which would be a blessing because this is obviously a worse recession. Then you would think that the market should get back to a fair value um, at you know over that three-year horizon. And if you think that we're going to get to a 19 stock multiple, which was roughly where it was trading before, not we don't have to worry about where it is today or next month, but but further out, two three years in the future, then that to a certain extent should cap the maximum amount of upside that you're going to have in the market. There shouldn't be more value out there than would be rational based on the earnings stream. So I I start by looking further away and then backing into okay, great if the cap is that we have, you know, 20% or 15% or whatever that number of upside is over the next two to three years, uh, then, okay, great. What am, what, what am I willing to pay for that opportunity? And it's, and it's, it's lower than where we are now. One of the ways that I try to dimension the support that the government has provided is that I think of them as cash transfers. Essentially, the government is engaging in cash transfers from the treasury to small businesses and consumers. Then on top of that, of course, you have the Fed, which has stepped in and provided significant direct support for the credit markets. That's all providing indirect support from a confidence standpoint to the stock market. And of course, the Fed has also said that they might consider buying stocks as well. So all that's going on in the background, and you have these cash transfers happening to consumers and businesses. And so when we say that the economy is down 30% 30% for the second quarter, which is our forecast, actually between 30 and 40%, depending on how fast different areas start to open up again, it would actually be significantly lower if we didn't have all this intervention. So at some point, one needs to ask, when will the government run out of money in the sense that it becomes politically unpalatable to continue this? And we're in an election year, which is what's even more fascinating about the situation, because unless we have a really quick reopening across the country without having new cases to to force people to go back into lockdown, we're going to need to have extensions of this fiscal support that's going on. And as you get closer to the election, it becomes less clear how that's going to play out. The thing which is really wonderful about being um, in the United States is that because we are the global currency and we are the strongest and deepest economy in the world, no matter how damaged it is right now, there truly is an, an almost infinite amount that the government can can stimulate. Now, that does not mean that there is not a massive hangover on the other side of this, but their ability to pour capital into this to keep things uh, moving along is is greater than it would be if you were in, let's say, um, a country in, in Europe or, or someplace else that doesn't have the flexibility to be able to run deficits um, if necessary the way we are. And I also think that we need to ask, like, why are they doing so much more now than they did during the financial crisis, because this is legitimately hitting the working um, person and the small business guy much harder than it did during the financial crisis. There's more of a um, sympathy or focus on doing the right thing by that individual that's displaced than helping their, directly helping their employers. And so because this is hitting employment so hard, the response is is much larger, and so I, I think that the the reality is is that this is going to go on for a while. But if you look through 
to, let's say, the election, it would seem that the unemployment benefits are going to run out, I think, in July, and the, the, ex- the expanded unemployment benefits, and clearly the support for businesses, the payroll protection, et cetera, that's going to run out as well. Do you think that the Congress is going to just continue to fund these things, or do you think that we may have a situation where um, we get a real shortfall in this backstop, the market starts to adjust for that? No, I mean, I, I think it's it's widely believed that they're going to continue to roll these um, you know, for as long as, as they need to. And if this takes us, you know, into the fourth quarter before we start to really re-engage in the economy, even if they even if we open up our doors, if there's still a reluctance for people to travel and get on planes and go to restaurants, there's still going to be people who are displaced. And I would assume that we're going to probably see these government programs going into probably year end or something like that. Take a look at how long the government support was for people who were displaced during the financial crisis. And if this is worse, um, you're really looking at a, a, a pretty uh, a pretty long period. Now, the right thing for the government to do was not to say this is an endless check and it's going to last forever. They, they put it out for a few months because nobody knows how long this is going to be. And I would be shocked if we don't see these programs extended. So, Megan... One of the things that, that you and I experience as, uh, as two colleagues is that I often call you up, fortunately for you, not, at, not in the middle of the night when I break out of the cold sweat, but usually in the morning um, because I'm nervous. You usually talk me off the ledge. Talk to us about some other things, some other reasons that the market may be a little bit more buoyant than if you just focused on those core economic fundamentals that Jonathan described for us would lead you to um, – basically want to go hide under the covers all day? Uh, It's a great question. I think two things that come to mind for me, one is the duration of this economic fallout. And the second is as it relates to interest rates. Um, and, And much of both of those relate to some things that you've already discussed. So on the duration of the economic fallout, Tony, as you mentioned, we expect the second quarter to be very ugly, contraction of anywhere from 30 to 50%. Uh, I think is is a realistic range. And so if you're looking at as a long-term equity investor, the question is, is this a very deep, we know it's going to be a deep contraction, but is it relatively short-lived? It could very well be that this is the deepest contraction on record, but also the shortest on record. Um, and if you're looking at a market that does take a couple years to get back to trend, but it does get back to trend, then it's quite possible that uh, investors are willing to look through that to the next, you know, maybe 2021 or 2022 earnings that are going to eventually resume back to trend. If, however, this is more of a permanent impairment of the earnings stream and, and the earnings trend that we've seen historically, similar to what we had in the global financial crisis, which I would describe as more of a, uh, a permanent derailment of that trend, then it's likely that the market is not appropriately pricing in the downside um, and the permanent loss of earnings that we could see. But I do think one other reason why uh, the market might be holding up is as it relates to the unprecedented stimulus that you've both already discussed um, and the earnings multiple. And what we've seen from the monetary stimulus is that it has had the effect of compressing credit spreads. Um, and reducing interest rates. And as we know, interest rates do factor in to how we value the what is the future stream of cash flows coming from businesses and the equity market broadly. The reduction in interest rates and the risk-free rate that we've seen has been significant. And this is probably adding to support for the equity multiple. Um, and I think as we look at both the interest rate environment And then historically, it makes it more difficult to compare historical uh, valuations because interest rates are at all-time lows and and lower than we've ever seen them or expected to see them. The point on interest rates really resonates because if you think about the last half decade, we've talked about the fact that multiples, even in a very low growth environment, have been justified being at a higher level than we might, might otherwise be comfortable with because the rate environment has been so low. So now the rate environment goes even lower. That's just another reason that supports equities. So Jonathan, coming back to you, if you think about the, the case that we've just made for sort of the uh, unlimited backstop of the both fiscal and monetary system, and you think about, let's assume that 
by the middle of next year, we have a vaccine. Um, maybe by the fall of next year, most people in this country have had a chance to either get vaccinated or they're, or they're immune. Is there a realistic scenario that you worry about that could cause sort of a violent reversal in the market where we go back down? And what do you worry about now that we've sort of established this very powerful safety net, which is sort of holding up the market? I think Megan actually kind of laid laid out the the, the storyline, and, and I would kind of almost like punctuate the three kind of three different things that I from from her comments. The first one is the virus is actually going to tell us what's going to happen. It's not the Fed can do whatever they want. The U.S. Treasury can can go, or the U.S. government can go and and um, support um, you know that somebody who's been displaced. But but the real most important question is when we open up the economy, and we're going to. Um, what does it look like in terms of recurrences? When do theme parks reopen? When do we get back to theaters? And if we see that as we reopen, that this starts to, that, that the number of cases begins to rise again, and they may not rise where, you know, in the same locations, but they may rise around the country, um, then, then that means that this thing is going to take a, a further leg down. But it's very possible that once we start to open this up, that maybe for seasonal reasons or, or for other reasons, that in fact the worst is behind us and, and we don't get those recurrences and, or that the number of deaths is as much as it's unfortunate fortunate will be one that won't overwhelm the hospital systems and there'll be enough testing in place and maybe some therapeutic solutions that won't be perfect but will will lower the mortality and that that we'll actually be able to successfully re-engage. And that's really the most, I I think, probably the most important issue. The, The second issue is how do you reopen the economy? And this is the single area that I think people underestimate the, the most. When I hear um, governors saying, well, maybe we'll start restaurants by pushing the table a little further apart from each other. Maybe they'll open up only at 50% of capacity, and then they'll, they'll increase from there. The, the question is, if you run a restaurant with only half of the guests there on a Saturday night, does the restaurant make money or does it lose money? If it loses money, then, they, then they're not going to want to open up. And in fact, that's what they're seeing in Wuhan. They're opening things, and they're seeing it in Germany, actually, as well, with the shops. They're opening it up, but no one's coming in, right? People, just because there's no one next to me, there's someone at two tables away, it's like going on an airplane. Just because the middle aisle is empty doesn't mean that I want to get on and off that airplane, and I want to sit next to somebody that's four feet away from me instead of literally four inches from me. I mean, this has got to push the savings rate up as well. So it's going to affect, for some period of time, consumer behavior. It's not just open it up and they'll come. Right. If we're allowed to reengage, there's going to be a sluggishness in our comfort to get back. But even if, even if let's say, it magically went away, businesses still need to hire back those workers, and it takes a little bit of time to do that. Businesses are going to have more financial debt, and therefore they're going to want to hold back on advertising budgets or CapEx for a period of time because they need to fix their balance sheets and replenish those things. And so, so the process of renormalization for a business, even if there was no virus at all, is not seamless. Um, if we end up here with a 15 or 20 percent unemployment rate at the peak, we're not going to get back down to three and a half in, in a year. It's going to take longer. We may we may get a big a big decline, and it could be the fastest um, improvement we've ever seen. But 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 then it's still going to take some time to get back to where we were, and then. Finally, the the last thing, and you talked about what's permanent, Megan, I think this was really key issue, is if we end up with big deficits and and debt and stuff like that on the other end of this, um, the government is going to either have to print a lot more money or they're going to have to raise taxes. And and Megan, I would love your your take on this, but what does that do for growth if taxes have to go up? Or what does that do for inflation if money printing has to um, increase in order to fill these? How, How do you think about that when you think about valuations? You know, when we think about valuations, it's essentially what you're willing to pay for earnings. Inflation does factor into that in terms of the interest rate. I don't think this is a near-term thing. So in terms of the, the genesis of Tony's original question, what could cause a sharp reversal, reversal, you know, in the next month or a few months, I don't think inflation is one of those, but that is one of the things that from a long-term perspective could have the impact of reducing the multiple that investors are willing to pay um, over the long term and have more of a structural effect on the multiple. Um, and taxes is something that I, I, I don't know exactly how 
to factor that in, but that is the risk as we look into, you know, November and we get closer to the election. Um, the, the other side of, uh, you know, if a Democrat does get the White House, then we're looking at a scenario where at some point, I wouldn't say it's in the near term. Again, these are both kind of longer term issues, but I would think taxes are, uh, an impairment of, earnings and the multiple. It does factor into both sides, and we'd probably see a reversal of the uh, the bump of both of those that we saw uh, in 2017. So it's it's a risk to be aware of. Yeah, and, and you can just look at the, the bump that we got of, let's say, 10% or so in the market from the corporate tax rate reduction. That That's something that even if... Um, even if it didn't get passed, if there is rhetoric in the direction that that um, a Democrat in office would, would would at least be assumed that they would 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 reverse those Trump tax cuts, then then the market may start to trade on on that earlier. It's all about uncertainty, which is the irony of where the market's trading today at basically cycle high valuations. If there is less uncertainty around the volatility of earnings and some of the downside risks, then the market will be willing to pay a higher multiple uh, on those on that the future earnings. But with greater uncertainty, you'd expect that to come down. And so that's kind of the, the, the irony and the conundrum we find ourselves in today. Jonathan, when you look at the market right now, do you think the market is, given all the considerations um, as as uncertain as many of them are, is fairly valued, or and, and do you think that um, the bottom is in? So let me let me first answer the question you're not a- asking, and then I'll get back to the ones you are. Which is, do I think that stocks will be higher in two or three years from now? Yes. Do I think that people who can stomach all of the uncertainty will ultimately get rewarded for sticking in, and they have a multi-year view of the world? Yes. So that, that's the starting point. Now, do I think that given what your upside downside opportunity is um, over the next three six you know months, it, it, that the, the market's fairly valued? Absolutely not. Do I think that the market will fall? I don't know if it tests the new lows or goes down by ten percent or or what have you. But you know, we have at, at Credit Suisse we have a, a twenty seven hundred target on the market, and the market right now is trading about 2800 I In my career, I've, I've never had a situation where I have a market target for year-end that's, um, that's below where it is. Stocks go up in general. But what I think is most likely is that, that, the, that ultimately stocks come down, the risk-reward becomes more balanced, and then it's probably a lot easier for you to recommend to your clients where you say, okay, yes, the market's come down, but now there's a 20 or 30% upside, and it's worth taking on the uncertainty because you're getting paid for it. Right now, I think the problem is, is that there's uncertainty. You're just not going to get paid in the market the kind of excess returns that you would need to take on that downside risk. And, and so I think it's a kind of upside downside risk balance that is, that is out of whack right now. Yeah, I see it the same way. And one of the ways that we express this very similar view is clients often ask us, well, I have some cash. Should I put it to work? And typically, we tell clients to put cash to work over 90 days, a third today, a third in 45 days, and a third in another 45 days. But markets tend to go up, so we don't want to wait too long. We also don't want to typically all put it to work on one day. So it's a pretty short, compressed period of time. Today, we're telling clients to wait six to 12 months to put the money to work um, and to stage it out much more gradually over, over that period of time. Uh, and that reflects the same kind of both uncertainty, but also, I think, imbalance in the opportunity set where there seems to be a lot more downside than upside opportunity right now, given where, given where equities are priced. So, Megan, where, where are there opportunities in the market? Um, and then, Jonathan, I'd like to ask you the same question, um, because we have a sort of bifurcated market where there are certain sectors that are actually performing really well, um, whether, it be, whether it be tech, whether it be staples, utilities. Then there, are, then there are sectors that are just getting crushed, obviously energy, but even financials, um, a lot of the value areas. So. Just talk to us, each of you, real quickly, if you could, about positioning. How would you put the portfolio together right now for a time horizon between now and the election? Yeah, I'll, I'd love to jump in there. So I think that we, we look at things across a number of different lenses. I'll, I'll focus on two, one being factors, um, which is to say uh, characteristics that stocks exhibit um, similar to kind of a style or, or how you might characterize um, stocks 
broadly, and then at the the industry level. Um, so when we look at factors, we're really looking to uh, include in our portfolio high quality companies. They've held up relatively well in this uh, in this market volatility. Companies that don't carry a tremendous amount of debt have a steady stream of earnings. Um, that's what we think of as kind of the high high quality. Um, and we also think that you need to have exposure to volatility dampening stocks, things that we refer to as minimum volatility. Um, and that can help ride through what we see and what you've both very well described is what's likely to be a, a bumpy road over the next few months. A lot of the qualities of companies that tend to be correlated with success right now are the same kind of qualities that correlate with um, ESG, environmental social governance, strength. So companies that are well-managed, that have strong balance sheets, relatively low leverage, good governance, all that kind of stuff, those, are the, those, those happen to be the kind of companies that are doing well in this environment. And in fact, you know, our ESG um, strategy and a lot of them across the industry are actually outperforming right now for those reasons. That's a great point. Um, and one other kind of thing to be looking at is where we are in this cycle. And typically, if you're talking about at some point, even if it's over the next year, kind of beginning this recovery process, bouncing off the bottom, that's typically an environment where you would look for the cheapest stocks, those value equities to do really well. Um, and we've given it a lot of thought. We've had a lot of discussions and done a lot of work on whether this is the moment for value to do well. Um, and I think it can do well. But we're also in this multi-year sectoral shift toward technology. And a lot of those companies that are really benefiting from that shift are more growthier type of stocks. And you think of, we think of growth as those stocks that generate their own organic growth. They don't refer, they don't rely on the economic cycle to generate that growth for them like a value stock would. So I think we're, we are finding ourselves as kind of at this crossroads now. At some point, we're going to begin this recovery process. And we have to think about this environment a little bit differently. Um, you know, we don't want to necessarily bet all in value. We also don't want to have no exposure to value. But um, I think this is an environment and a cycle where growth could kind of pick up where it left off. And those, those bigger technology companies trading at more elevated valuations could continue to do well. And, you know, first of all, I, it's, it's a little disappointing, Megan, that you and I are, our, our views are lining up so much because I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to have a little bit of a count, point counterpoint and we're kind of on the same page. But, um, I, if I look at characteristics and, and I think that that's the starting point, characteristics are more important than sectors here, but the characteristics to me are big, growthy, stable, and American. So let me e e explain that. Larger companies have a substantially better opportunity to come out on the other side of this. They have greater access to capital markets if they need to borrow or raise capital. They tend to have more cash on their balance sheets. Um, they, they tend to have the kind of professional management that allows them to navigate this um, most effectively and address things like supply chain problems um, in ways that smaller companies don't necessarily have those opportunities. And we're seeing that smaller caps are having a really hard time here where larger caps, and I'm not even talking about the very biggest, but the S&P compared to the Russell 2000, the big caps are doing much better. Number one, growthy. If you take a look at the broadly defined tech universe, it is substantially outperforming, um, and it's not because you know people are just enamored with the, the tech story. They're just delivering much, much better earnings. Their earnings are proving to be really resilient. Now, it doesn't mean every tech stock is, is equal, but those that have growth that don't need the economy, and, and you think about areas like software as, as, or cloud, um, those are just doing substantially better. So we have big, we have growth, a stable. If we take a look at this earnings season and you look at cyclical uh, sectors, cyclical companies, their earnings are likely to fall in the first quarter um, um, when all the results are in by about 50% um, versus a year ago. And that is in, in a quarter where we only really had three weeks that we were staying at home. So there's a lot of vulnerability of more cyclical, um, cyclically exposed businesses. Those that are more stable, consumer staples, household brands and healthcare companies and utilities and telcos, they are probably going to deliver a flat quarter. Now, zero may not sound wonderful, but compared to down 50, 
um, a big difference. So big, growthy, stable, and American is if you take a look at the kind of companies, forget about the fact that the American economy may be stronger and other things like that, but the companies that are in the S&P 500 tend to just have the, the characteristics you want. And so there are, are fewer banks that are vulnerable to loan losses in the U.S. than there are in Europe. Europe is more fin- exposed to the banking sector. The U.S. has less industrials. Europe has more. Um, the U.S. has more technology. Um, Europe has less. So from that perspective, and the U.S. companies actually tend to also be larger. Um, so when you add those together, um, and those, I, I think that that's the way you play it, and that's largely been the way that the market has played for the last three or four years. But I think it's probably uh, it's what's going to get you through this crisis in, in the best uh, way as well. Yeah, and Jonathan, we have a structural underweight to non-U.S. developed um, at a policy portfolio, long-term allocation standpoint. We've had it for a long time, and what's going on today, I think, even strengthens the need for that kind of view expressed in a portfolio. The strength around the innovation that we're seeing in the U.S. uh, and the argument that that makes for just continuing to invest in U.S. stocks, I think, is very, very strong, even with the dollar as as relatively strong as it is now. It's not to say we shouldn't be diversified, because at some point, we'll pay the price for all the money that we're spending, and the dollar may weaken and such. But um, at least for the foreseeable future, having a strong U.S. overweight, I think, is a very, very sound approach to investing. I think that there's a couple things I just I would add because I, I really entirely agree with what you're saying. The U.S. economy is the most whole economy in the world. We we produce medicines, we produce new technologies, we have an enormous uh, agricultural sector and export. I mean, compared to let's say Japan where they need to import food or where, you know, or other countries around the world that do certain things really well, but they don't do everything. And so if we're in a world that comes under stress, the U.S. can be more self-reliant than anyone else. And to the extent that we leave this, where globalization takes a step back, where if, they, if the, some of these um, issues uh, between China and the rest of the world um, become more severe or continue, um, the U.S. would be less damaged by those. Uh, Europe is far more China exposed than the U.S. is. That's not even considering the most important thing, which is all of the innovative technology, or not all, but the vast majority of it is happening here in the U.S., I think makes the U.S. compelling over the long run. I want to um, just summarize three key takeaways. I think that number one is that I think it's critical to understand that as disconnected as the market seems to be from economic fundamentals, it is critical to sort of suspend belief here in fundamentals and understand that the Fed and the U.S. Congress uh, has the back of the economy right now. And that's probably principally why the market is hanging in there the way that it it is. Uh, And that's going to continue. Number two is that even though we think that structurally we're going to make it through this largely because of the role the government's played. That doesn't mean we're not going to continue to have a lot of volatility in markets. That doesn't mean that we think equities for a six to nine month time horizon are valued fairly. We think that they're probably too expensive and we should expect to see uh, some, some drawdowns as some bad news comes out and makes the market nervous that this reopening process won't go as smoothly. Um, whether it's new cases, new waves, therapies that aren't working, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, I would say there are interesting trends that continue to shape how we invest around focusing on the companies that are doing well now, but will continue to do well in the new normal. Growth companies, large cap companies, U.S. companies in general, software, cloud, things of that nature. And that as investors, we need to continue to accept the possibility that even though by historic standards, they may actually represent a larger market cap share than they have in the past, or they continue to do well, that those trends could actually continue um, and not necessarily expect a mean reversion um, the way we have in the past in, in all of these particular situations. So special thanks again to both Jonathan and Megan for joining us today, as well as our listeners. Thank you guys so much. Great. Happy to do it. Thanks for having this me. This is fun. I want to thank our listeners for joining us, and I encourage you to visit WilmingtonTrust.com 
for a roundup of our investment and planning content. You can subscribe to Capital Considerations on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast channel to ensure you get updates on future episodes. Thank you again for listening. This podcast is for information purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the sale of any financial product or service or recommendation or determination that any investment strategy is suitable for a specific investor. Investors should seek financial advice regarding the suitability of any investment strategy based on the investor's objectives, financial situation, and particular needs. The information on Wilmington Trust's capital considerations with Tony Roth has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but its accuracy and completeness are not guaranteed. The opinions, estimates, and projections constitute the judgment of Wilmington Trust as of the date of this podcast and are subject to change without notice. Wilmington Trust is not authorized to and does not provide legal or tax advice. Our advice and recommendations provided to you is illustrative only and subject to the opinions and advice of your own attorney, tax advisor, or other professional advisor. Diversification does not ensure a profit or guarantee against a loss. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. Past performance cannot guarantee future results. Investing involves a risk and you may incur a profit or a loss. Any reference to company names mentioned in the podcast should not be constructed as investment advice or investment recommendations of those companies. Facts and views presented in this report have not been reviewed by and may not reflect information known to professionals in other business areas of Wilmington Trust or M&T Bank and may provide to seek to provide financial services to entities referred to in this report. M&T Bank and Wilmington Trust have established information barriers between their various business groups. As a result, M&T Bank and Wilmington Trust do not disclose certain client relationships or compensation received from such entities in their reports. Investment products are not insured by the FDIC or any other governmental agency, are not deposits of or other obligations of or guaranteed by Wilmington Trust, m and Bank, or any other bank or entity, and are subject to risk, including a possible loss of the principal amount invested. Wilmington Trust is a registered service mark used in connection with various fiduciary and non-fiduciary services offered by certain subsidiaries of m and Bank Corporation, including, but not limited to, Manufacturers and Traders Trust Company, m and Bank, Wilmington Trust Company, WTC, operating in Delaware only, Wilmington Trust NA, WTNA, Wilmington Trust Investment Advisors, Inc., WTIA, Wilmington Funds Management Corporation, WFMC, and Wilmington Trust Investment Management, LLC, WTIM. Such services include trustee, custodial agency, investment management, and other services. International corporate and institutional services are offered through m Bank Corporation's international subsidiaries. Loans, credit cards, retail and business deposits, and other business and personal banking services and products are offered by m Bank, member FDIC. 2021 m Bank Corporation and its subsidiaries, all rights reserved.